And sometimes I think people that, that are like kind of crappy people seek out therapy so that they can develop the language to justify how crappy they are. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Totally. Like, oh, the word boundary is just like a laundry list of shit I don't want my partner to do. Great. (laughs) And welcome back. You're listening to Hysteria, the show for people who were a joy to have in class, but have since learned to be a pain in the ass when it counts. Alyssa, were you a joy to have in class? Uh, I was a joy to have in class, though also always noted Alyssa talks too much. (laughs) Same. I got. What are you tr- gonna do? I the had only opinions. Only time I got in trouble in elementary school was for being too social, which is me too. Me too. Ridiculous. Exactly. What else? And for pl- planning like things, I I was always like colluding with other classmates, like when I was real little. <laughs> Your little uh, conspiracy monger. Um, that's great. Let's get right to introducing today's panel. I'm excited to talk about. I guess like a kind of bifurcated topic of conversation, but they are linked with some wordplay. Our next panelist is going on tour this fall. That's Messed Up, an SVU podcast is hitting 22 cities starting in September. Get your tickets at thatsmessedup.live.com. Kara Clank, welcome back to Hysteria. Hello. Thank you for having me back. How's everybody doing? Doing great. But I want to wish you a happy new episodes of Bluey Day to you and all who celebrate. Oh, there's new episodes <laughs> oh, today? There's 10 new episodes on Disney Plus today. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. I know. I know. Oh, my God. I just went on this other podcast. I think that actually came out today. I was on Amber Ruffin's podcast with my co- co-host, Lisa, and they asked us we did like a newlywed game thing where they were like one of the questions that I had to answer and she had to guess my answer was what fictional family would you want to be part of and she was like oh my god I don't know and she guessed something else and I go I said the family from Bluey and she goes I forgot that you want to fuck the dad from Bluey everybody (laughs) everybody wants to fuck the dad from Bluey Guys, you know I'm Googling the dad from Bluey now. It, okay, first of all, it's a cartoon dog. He's just a really good dad. I like it's, to have it's a, a big cartoon dad. dad. He's a really good dad. He's a really good dad, but he really loves his wife, and like they're really still, they're like very cute and romantic with each other. Oh, like, guys, he's cute. <laughs> he's a cartoon <laughs> dog, everyone. I want everyone to know it's a cartoon dog. Yeah, and um, for cartoon dogs, he's good. Something, yeah. <laughs> something that really messed with my head. So Bluey, for people who don't have children that are under five uh, is an Australian cartoon about a family of dogs um, and they just like do imagination games and play together there's uh, and they're really great and uh, Bingo is and Bingo is the sister and Bluey is the older sister and uh, Bluey is the closest thing in this house that we have to a god at this point uh, <laughs> my daughter is so I actually obsessed. stopped by I stopped by Aaron's house yesterday to drop something off and she came out with her daughter wearing bluey merch so yes. I can attest yes. this is bluey is huge <laughs> yes uh, it's it's the only thing that she cares about she sometimes wakes up in the morning going bluey bluey she wants to like feed her bluey doll while she's eating she's really obsessed um but yeah new episodes so now we can stop watching oh my the God. same huge episodes huge. over and over again and there by the way are about 60 episodes already out i've just seen that they're only eight minutes but i've seen them all so many times so 10 new ones is like oh my gosh right it's i'm gonna like let them a- watch extra tv tonight the new Bluey episodes are like what a new Taylor Swift album is to Taylor Swift fans. Like, I am just like, <laughs> I just need some new material. Um, new Bluey drop. New yeah, Bluey. And finally, rounding out the panel, it's time to introduce our a first timer to Hysteria. She's a comedian, podcaster, and writer who just released her debut book, Raw Dog, The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs. I love the title so much. I need to pause and just like... Take it in. It, quote, tells us what the creation, culture, and class influence on hot dogs says about America now, and we can't wait to read. Jamie Loftus, welcome to Hysteria. Hey, thanks for having me. I so think the dad from dogs? Bluey is hot. Oh, good. But why hot dogs? There's not a lot of books about hot dogs. There was a, And there is no books by women about hot dogs. And this is a very specific thing I was trying to correct. No, there was just, I, I, I really love hot dogs i I do too it's just like it's kind of a great equalizer everyone has a strong opinion on hot dogs even if they don't particularly like them um and i never there was no uh sort of book that included a celebration of hot dogs and sort of all the uh disgusting difficult parts about them in the sort of same zone so i wanted to be the person to to attempt it so what did your life look like when you were researching this book? Like how much time per day did you spend on hot dogs? It was uh, 
sweaty time. It was a greasy time. It was a stinky time (laughs) in my life. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, (laughs) it was all the research was done almost two years ago now, but it was like uh, summer 2021. Uh, We were traveling around doing five or six hot dogs a day uh, in different states, kind of just trying to get as wide a sample size of not just like kinds of hot dogs to try, but types of businesses, uh, people to talk to, different regions, all this stuff. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was really fun, but I it it did it did something to my brain chemistry. Like I, you just start to feel like something is wrong. I've never been less horny in my life. <laughs> like <laughs> just <laughs> all sorts of sort of cast off effects. I mean, even though I learned a lot of pretty horrific things in the process of writing that book, I, hot dogs are a more uh, normal part of my diet than they ever have been. It's not Whoa. at that rate, but that... I'm like, every time I go Wait. to a new city, I'm that's sort of like stop number one. Jamie, as someone who went to school in Wisconsin and had friends who were interns in, uh, on the Wienermobile, did you oh. ever get in the Wienermobile? Was this yes. part of your research? Yes. You did? Yes. I have a chapter on the Wienermobile because I wanted to know what the situation was there because I heard I was sort of like following a very specific Wienermobile around because the deal there is that they you're it's like a it's kind of an arranged marriage where the program will put two people uh, in a Wienermobile for six months. That's it. That's kind of the only person you interact with other than people who want to be near the Wienermobile. And I learned that one in two of those pairings end up getting married, which means what? that people are having sex in the Wienermobile. And so I was like, really? Wiener babies. <laughs> there are Wiener babies. It's so, it's, ah! the pairing I ended up following, they were great. They were not a marriage pairing. They were, it was very like antagonistic sibling vibes. But that meant that they were very open about because they weren't having sex. They're like, oh, yeah, but like a lot of people are. And um, I, he wouldn't let me put it in the book, but I am allowed to talk about it now that the book is out. The they also have these like names, like the the two people I was following around were Nacho Dog Nick and Little Link Lauren. Those are my sources on Whoa. the inside. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and they were like, once our contract with Oscar Mayer expires, you can tell people what you know, but not while we're still in the Wienermobile. So now that they're out and they're living normal lives. Um, they uh there there's a seat there's six seats i believe in the wienermobile and the back left seat is called the meat seat because that's where they have sex with each other <gasps> the meat seat the meat seat oh yeah. my what's like the hot dog equivalent to the mile high club <laughs> yeah oh my <laughs> like god foot long club like what <laughs> foot long club yeah the frankfurter Ooh. club yeah like what <laughs> yeah see so if you survive the meat seat um, you're probably about to get married to a fellow Wienermobile driver. It's such a Jesus. bizarre pipeline. Uh, <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, uh, oh my that's god. a show. That's a show. Where did you find the best hot dog out of all the places that you ate them? Uh, I I was really hoping I would have like a not like other hot dog fans answer for this, but the general pe- most people say that the best hot dog in the country is at Rut's Hut in Clifton, New Jersey. And I think that they're right about that. That is the best hot dog in the country that uh, that I had at least or have since. How does it compare to Nathan's? Like Coney uh, Island Nathan, Nathan's. Nathan's, I, they're, I like the culture around Nathan's. I love the Nathan's contest. I was there last week covering it, but the hot dog itself is fine. Uh, Rudd's <laughs> Hut is amazing because they do this thing where they they like deep fry the hot dog for like two seconds so it just gets a little crispy around the edges and it's just like the greatest thing in the entire world and it's it also just feels like where you would go after you commit a murder in New Jersey the vibes are really kind of haunting but you you would bring a family there that. too it's just the best <laughs> wow murderers and families alike can I would say you really, over it, Jamie wieners. you really sold me on committing a murder in New Jersey so um right? thank you uh <laughs> wait Jamie can I ask you a quick question mm-hmm. like I'm a vegetarian obviously I remember what hot dogs taste like I do miss them and when I go to like foot baseball games I really like to get a hot dog and I get the veggie dog and it just tastes like rubber band 
Did you do any research in the vegetarian hot dog space? Are we on our way to something better, like an impossible burger for hot dogs? Like, or is that just like a sacrilegious question to even ask you? No, no. There's hot dogs are for <laughs> everybody. Uh, no, there's there's good vegan brats out there. I feel like there's been more progress in the brat space than the hot dog space. The brat space, but, yes, so true. But you're but you're in LA, so you could. There's a few good vegan hot dogs in. LA. I love the one at Walt's Bar. That is like oh, incredible. Wait, that's right near dog. me. Yeah. And I didn't know they had a, a vegan dog. It's so I gotta good. go. It's really, Let's really go to good. Walt's. Let's go. It's literally, I think, like a midpoint between our houses, practically. No you should go. Yeah. Highly yeah, I recommend. Can walk there. I can walk there. <laughs> um, okay. Speaking of wieners, let's get into uh, the story. Yes. Terrific yes, segue. segue. The news is biggest <laughs> wiener this week, and that is uh, Jonah Hill. So for people who haven't been following along, and if you are one of the blessed people who don't know what what this story is, I envy you and I'm sorry for ruining your day. So basically, Jonah Hill's ex-girlfriend, Sarah Brady, released a bunch of text messages that they exchanged during and kind of after their relationship. She accused him of emotional abuse, and she released all this on her Instagram stories. She's a semi-professional surfer, which is a detail that's necessary to kind of understand what he was asking her to do. The messages shared by Sarah, who's 26, showed a contact she'd save as Jonah, asking her to remove photos and videos of herself surfing. She is a surfer. He wants her to remove (laughs) Instagram photos and videos of herself surfing. And anything that showed her, quote, ass in a thong from her Instagram page. This is a warning to all girls, Sarah said. If your partner is talking to you like this, make an exit plan. Call me if you need an ear. Jonah also said he was super controlling and weird. Did you guys see these posts that he yeah. did? Yeah, yes. yeah. He, he also said that removing the post was a good start before he questioned why there were still photos of her surfing and bathing suits at all on her page. And uh, according to the screenshots, he wrote, I've made my boundaries clear. You refuse to let go of some of them and you've made it that clear. And I hope it makes you happy. Um, He also told her he didn't want her surfing with men, posting sexual pictures and boundaryless inappropriate friendships with men, modeling. He also didn't want her being friends with women who are in unstable places. And then Jonah said that he was not the right partner for her. Quote, if these things bring you to a place of happiness, I support it and there will be no hard feelings. These are my boundaries for romantic partnership. Jamie, are those boundaries? Hmm. Uh, no, this sounds like a job application. It sounds horrible. <laughs> like this list reminds me kind of of like trying to get jobs in media in the early 2010s. Like just bizarro, blamey. Be- I I don't know. I I just it's just gross to me. And I I hope that he's extremely embarrassed because it just especially for someone who released a documentary about therapy in the last year um, and has been so vocally like, you know, uh, (laughs) male feminist uh, in the way that Jonah Hill has, like, it just doesn't square whatsoever. And I think it's, and I think we're seeing kind of like more examples of people like this who really like walk the walk theoretically. But if you learn even a little bit about their personal relationships, they're projecting their insecurities like there's like no tomorrow. And also just do not understand what the word like doesn't, he doesn't know what the word boundaries means. Boundaries means something that he's insecure and uncomfortable about to him and like controlling a woman's behavior based on it and the fact that she's a surfer on top of all of this just makes it like crosses into ridiculous territory I don't know this story is just I sweat through my clothes when I read this (laughs) yeah I mean mean, same we did a show um, a few months ago about the weaponization of therapy language and you know Jonas sort of made himself Mr. Therapy and you could just see that he was using these words in a way that weren't the way that they were intended. Alyssa, did you also sweat when you read these exchanges or when you read about this? Uh, I did. I, I, I more eye rolled instead of sweat. Look, he's allowed to live his life the way that he wants to. And he's allowed to seek out a partner that is going to live in a space that makes him comfortable, but he started dating a surfer. Like what was, like what did he think was going to happen? So it feels like, it feels uh, 
it feels dumb. It feels like gaslighting. It feels like, but then also, you know, releasing text messages, you always, you're never really getting the full story. So we don't know. But based on what we know, he's a fucking nut nut. And he was trying to use his therapy words in his text to her to like inoculate himself from criticism. And like, that's not, that's not worked. That's mm-hmm. not worked. Kara, I wonder what you made of this exchange. Do you think it's like, I mean, I've seen people talk about it being fucked up that she released text messages from the context of their relationship. Do you agree that it's messed up or not? Well, I saw, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, after I dropped my kids off at school. I usually just do my normal 20 20 to 30 minutes of thinking about Jonah Hill after I drop my kids (laughs) off every morning. And um, I was thinking about that because, you know, I saw a tweet from from a friend who was like, I really just hate this. Like, I hate the violation of privacy, like of of sharing screenshots. And then other people are like, yes, but women need to feel empowered to know that like they, they need to share their stories so that they know that this isn't you know, a, an imp- like a good way to be um, treated, that this isn't normal, like to not normalize it. And I was thinking, I wonder if she could have released them without it being his name, but it's like, that's the most famous person she's associated with. It wouldn't have gotten to as many women as it has if it wasn't for his fame. I'm really torn about it. I'm torn. Like, I do think she, I, I do think she, like, I don't know. They are private text messages, but I do like the message that she's sending to people, which is like, you know, not all like kinds of abuse is like with fists and, and like immediate, like, and, and verbal, like screaming. It's not always what you see on like a television show. Like these kind of restrictive move, like restricting your movement, restricting who you're allowed to be friends with, like all that kind of stuff. And then couching it in therapy language, it's really dangerous. And so I'm glad that we're having the conversation. You know, I don't, Jared, if you're listening, please don't release any private text messages between the two of us, <laughs> yeah, no seriously. matter what happens. I mean, but, you know. I feel like we're going to have to conduct our relationships like people conduct business now. Like, mm-hmm. if you want to, if the, don't write anything down that you don't want possibly going public. So if, like, someone says something that triggers you, you're going to be like, hey, give me a call real, real quick. We're going to talk. Oh, that's, like, why everybody does voice notes, I feel like. Nobody wants things written down anymore. Like, every, when anybody wants to talk shit, it's like you get a little voice note in your text message box you know this -hmm. seems like such a a bizarre case because I do agree like I think everyone not on this scale but it's like there's definitely text I've sent in a relationship that I would be absolutely mortified uh if it ever reached the public in any meaningful way like that has to feel horrible no matter who you are but it's I don't know yeah this case is so tricky because it's like I don't that's not something that I could see myself doing but I feel like including who he is if she wants to talk about this is almost necessary because of like who he's saying he is in public versus who he is in private so if it, if you lose the context of who it is then I mean that does not that that can't be impactful and helpful to people who follow her but I feel like it's if her point is like this is who this person says he is this is who they are in private how do you kind of square that I don't know I feel like the the weekend text release was useful in that it was instructive about the kind of person that Jonah Hill was within the context of their relationship um on Monday she released more text messages and when I read about those I was like I feel like this maybe should not have been released publicly. Ooh, she oh the ones about sexting after their breakup, and the new relationship. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like that was a little bit like okay, clearly you were hurt by the way that the relationship ended, and that's why you're you know posting this. And I think that that to me feels like um that makes me feel not great reading about it like I don't really need to know those things Jonah's girlfriend just had a baby um and yeah this was the part that I was very uncomfortable about is that she addresses this and she's like I was gonna release the text messages sooner but didn't want to cause harm to the pregnancy so I'm releasing them like three weeks after the baby was born like I just maybe would have eliminated that altogether because neither one of those things sounds good you know what I mean yeah 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 leave the baby out of it Okay, leave Leave the the baby. Okay, do what you got to do. But let's not say you had an actual like mental gymnastics about the effect your texts would have on the baby. I I don't know. And her point was to in releasing the second batch was that 
that was like further gaslighting him saying, what are you talking about? I never, we never had sexted or had inappropriate communication. And she's like, here's all the examples. And he's like, I, you are out of your mind. I got to go. Like, and he's gaslighting a little bit. Hmm. Right. And it, but, it is worth noting, he has not responded to any of this. Yeah. Mm. I mean, he might be busy. He's got a three week old baby. <laughs> He does know, I know, but I'm just saying it's like he has not, you know, he has not released any text messages. He hasn't, he's letting this lie, I guess. Are we dealing with some semantic creep here? Like, are we witness, like, a lot of people have used the word abuse, and she uses the word abuse, and so I don't want to question her experience and her feelings about this. Um, But I'm seeing a lot of people who are discussing it, who are not involved in it, who don't know all the facts, being kind of fast and loose with some pretty extreme language. Kara, it seems like you think that we have enough reason to say that this is like an example of abusive behavior. Is is that accurate? Yeah, I would say, I think it's abusive behavior to constantly make somebody second guess what they're posting, what they're wearing, who they're hanging out with. To be controlling over someone like that in any way feels abusive to me. I'm not going to say, like, I, I don't know what, if we're going to make a scale of abuse here, but like, that feels, that feels abusive to me. And like, we, when I was, I, we ta- I talked about this on my podcast yesterday, but the episode won't come out for weeks. So, but um, we, my co-host Lisa had a great point where she goes, there are women like this. If you want to date a woman who dresses modestly, who listens to everything you say, who will not have friendships with a single other woman if you don't want her to, or a single other man, there's women out there like that. You don't want a woman like that. You want a woman who's like strong and powerful that you can then control and kind of break down. And I thought that was like a really interesting point because we see that all the time, you know? Right. But the other thing, yes to that. Um, but the other thing too, that's a little like, I don't know, is that he lays out what would, what makes him feel comfortable and says, and if this doesn't work for you, like go with God, no hard feelings. So like, so she could go with God. She could have left. Right. Yeah. I mean, like I'm not, I just think if you're only going to release text messages without context and that's the only thing we have to go on, I, I saw that and I was like, okay. I mean, I realize there's so much more going on, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Like there are two different ways, I mean, two extreme ways that a, that a partner might try to control you verbally. And one is like by couching it in gentle therapy speak and trying to make it seem as like, you know, light a touch as possible. And the other one is to just like straight up be like, you look like a slut, you know, like to, to come out and actually say the words. But the subtext in what he was saying to her about like n- not wanting her to go surfing with men, excuse me? Like, how is she going to do that? She's a surfer. Yeah, like, what in the name of Mike Pence is going on here? Like, you're not allowed to have, uh, like... Yes. You're not allowed to have interactions with the opposite sex? Like, that's that's where I was like, okay, yeah, he's letting her out of the relationship if she wants, but these demands are, like, Crazy. bonkers and right. very, like, re- like, you know, regressive and, yeah. Jamie, have you ever been in a relationship where you felt controlled by a person who considered himself like a male feminist like an enlightened guy who actually oh, yeah was... <laughs> yeah like, of course. How, did, how did that go did you get flashbacks reading this yeah I mean it's I, I think that I don't know this is such a like loaded and bizarre story because I, I am with you Kara on on what you and Lisa were talking about on how I don't know. Like, I think with, and it's, I don't know, it it sounds like because of who Jonah Hill presents himself as in public and probably who he thinks himself as being, like, I think that there is like some level of disconnect with how he views himself, uh, which maybe doesn't speak well of his therapist he made a whole ass documentary about. Uh, but um it seems, yeah, like there's some sort of like puzzle he's solving here of like, I like the idea of being with a woman who is like very in control of herself, like is, is like, you know, a very powerful, cool person, but I actually can't deal with it. So what can I do to have both at the same time? And like, it's, I, I think that I've, you know, like every case is different, but I think I've been in like smaller versions of that and uh in most cases i have gone with god and bailed but i you know it's it's uh it's it's a tricky 
situation to be put in too, but especially with someone with like that kind of power who's like, oh, you're so cool. Like, I mean, and we don't know what their relationship was like up until that, but it's like if he's gassing her up and then once you're in the relationship, it's like, well, actually you need to adjust your behavior to still seem like the cool person that I, right. you know, I claim mean, to have fallen he very in love quickly, with. But... He very quickly turned into Jim Bob Duggar when they were in the relationship. Right, right. <laughs> Which is disorienting. Like if you're the person in that position, I mean, I don't know. It's also like you're saying, Alyssa, the context is so fuzzy. You're like, how far into the relationship is this? Like, I have no idea. Um, but that, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, she, she, could have left but it's also like that's so that's such a disorienting hard turn to take once you've like entered this relationship fundamentally he needs more therapy <laughs> yeah more a different better therapist whatever. too like you said you yeah like yeah. i feel like for some people uh therapy just serves to validate their behavior because their therapist is only getting their side of the story and like i don't know i feel as though there's a person like Jonah Hill can be behaving as though he's like wounded, like he has a deep wound. But I think a therapist's job is to help him understand that his actions and demands come from the, his place of wounding and that he needs to focus on fixing that himself rather than being like, it's fine, I'm wounded and there's nothing I can do about it and this is just what I demand. I feel like it, therapists sometimes treat crappy behavior like an immutable personality it, like trait. And that um, that sucks. And sometimes I think people that, that are like kind of crappy people seek out therapy so that they can develop the language to justify how crappy they are. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, totally. Like, oh, the word boundary is just like a laundry list of shit I don't want my partner to do. Great. Got it. <laughs> like, here we go. Right. And Kara, to your point, can't be disputed because I'm just calling it a boundary. Yeah. Yes. I'm not saying I will harm you if you don't do it. I'm just calling it a boundary. But like, I'm also threatening to withhold love or the relationship, you know? Yeah. It feels like the subtext to that is like, well, if you cannot meet this bound, because it, calling it a boundary instead of a demand makes it seem like she's unreasonable if she doesn't seriously consider doing this. Totally. I mean, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, in a way, he was setting a boundary, right? <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> These Aaron, are my boundaries. I love Zelensky. when you get into foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> he was setting a boundary, guys. That's you guys yeah, are Russia. <laughs> can't leave with it. Or yeah. I mean, I thought it was also interesting that at the same time as this story was unfolding, this Kiki Palmer story was unfolding, which like was where her baby's father criticized something she wore as being like basically too slutty, and um, sh and was like, "You're a mom," and she said. And he said in a tweet, double doubling down, he was like, this is these are my beliefs. This is what I think. Like, I think that it's OK for the thought like someone who's who's like, uh, this is my family and this is my beliefs. And I'm like, I don't agree with him at all. But I think that's like where the difference is a little bit is that Jonah Hill's purporting to be a different person. Like, he's not saying these are my beliefs in, pr in public, but in private, these are his beliefs that a woman should not be fraternizing with the opposite sex or wearing a thong in public or whatever. Wearing literally he's what she bobbing. would wear to work. It's so like yeah. this, the surfing aspect just makes it even more ridiculous. Yeah, it's not like she was an investment banker who took up surfing after they got together out of like a histrionic desire for attention. <laughs> like she, that's I'm her job. also kind of generally in favor of that's kind of yeah, funny. that's cool. Do it, do it. If you've got a, a nice butt and you enjoy surfing, put your butt in a swimsuit and get on a surfboard. Nobody's gonna complain. Um, I, it's it's uh yeah, like we we said during this conversation, it is a complicated thing and we don't know the full extent of what happens inside of a person's relationship but making demands on a partner uh are not that's not a boundary that's that's a demand and uh jonah hill seems like he was a crappy boyfriend i think we can all agree yeah cosign yeah.